like shade, man. Shade in the shade. I don't know if we can go, we can't go into the water, but we'll walk next to it. It's just too fast. So at that other two spots ago, was that like a natural spring coming that out of there? the head of the spring, yeah. That okay. was where that whole rushing water come out from that calm hole over there. Okay, so there's some people over here going towards the border of Lebanon. Okay, brothers and sisters, if you come a bit near, we don't want to make too much noise for the other group, so I can uh, explain a little bit. Uh, what we're doing now, we're actually overlooking the northern border with Lebanon. We're on the border with Lebanon, so brought you all the way to the northern border. Check. Is that, a, is that that right there? That is already that village that you see there. Half of it is on the Lebanese side and the other half is on the Israeli side. Those hills, everything yeah. you see that is all Lebanon. So that mountain up there is Lebanon, right? And half of it is. Half there's of still it. some... Uh, border of Lebanon. There's still some military on that Israeli military. I'm not sure if it's Israeli military. Actually, I think it's um, weather monitoring stations up there. And they monitor whether the Syrians are going to attack or not. <laughs> <laughs> so here we are looking at the border of Israel. And okay, this is the border, the northern point of Israel. And what you see off in the distance is the country of Lebanon. Five regular armies came and attacked Israel the very next day that they declared independence. And uh, around 1949, they were already able to establish the borders. And I showed you that map to your to the group so you could see that the borders and you could see the two different maps, what they offered us and what they actually got in 1949. So this would have been the border here with Lebanon. So once the Arabs understood, okay, Israel is a fact, we can't deny that there's going to be a country of Israel. And the next thing they did is, okay, they're going to probably just be overwhelmed to a certain point that they'll all consume themselves. <laughs> because they're going to have to deal with a whole bunch of refugees coming in from Europe. 
and we're gonna help them as well. We're gonna kick all the Jews from Syria, from uh, there was Jews in uh, Egypt, in Lebanon, in Iraq. There's still Jews in Iran too, and they had to leave all their wealth behind, and they were kicked out of the country. And uh, they said there's no way they can make it. And indeed, the first years, the first seven years of the state of Israel, they had to absorb a million people. 600,000 people had to absorb a million people that came from northern Africa and from Europe and from the Muslim uh, states as well. But uh, what a surprise that uh, their economies, the uh, Muslim economies, the, all the Muslim countries, their economies were going down, 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 and this economy of this newly born state was going up, up and up. How did this happen? Wow, we do not know. <laughs> Especially due to the fact that when you have three Jews in the room, you have five opinions. But still, six <laughs> But still, they were able. And you come with it. So, what happens later on is that the. <laughs> I don't know what it is, but it was you got to go and talk to him before you say a statement like that. They, you know, they told me it was a war of the lamb. A war of the lamb? The lion. The lion, okay. Who knows what it is? Now, anyhow, um, I was going to say, what was I going to say? I was going to mention that uh, there was a certain point when the Arabs get a great leader, a man by the name of uh, Jamal Abdel Nasser in the 50s and in the 60s. And he was able to do something that nobody did before him. He was able to unite all the Arab countries under one leadership, under the Egyptian leadership. And it was somewhat like the United States of Arabia. At that very, at that same time, at that same time, um, <clears throat> Israel had this idea that they're going to bring life to the desert by laying a uh, pipeline from the lake all the way down to the south. That's that power station that we passed mm. by today. Mm. So, uh, the Arabs said, what? They're going to bring life to the desert? No, we can't let that happen. And they had this very ambitious idea that they were going to divert the water of the springs because if Israel wants to pump out water from the lake and they sit on the lake, how are we going to stop that? Well, we're going to dry up the lake. So we're, how are we going to dry up the lake? We're going to divert the waters of the Jordan River and have it go all around the lake and spill into the south and go straight down to the Dead Sea. A very ambitious plan, but if you saw that caterpillar up here, that old caterpillar, that was, if you take a closer look, you would have seen it was a Soviet caterpillar, and they were getting ready to do exactly that, to divert the water. Now, water here in the Middle East, you know, that's a uh, Casas Bailey. That's the reason to go to war. Yeah. So, you're going to touch our water. So, what they did was, they, the Israelis, said, okay, we're going to have to, if you do that, we're going to bomb you guys up. We're going to send the artillery. And they go send the artillery, and they start aiming, firing, and they miss. Say, my gosh. That ain't good. So they take the whole artillery corps, send them down to the desert. You're not living here until you can hit the pin of a needle. Bring the tanks in. So they had these Sherman tanks back then. And they bring the tanks in and they take positions. And they aim, fire, miss. And miss. Oh my gosh, what is going on here? Take the tank corps, send them down to the desert. They're not going to leave until they can hit the pin of a needle. This is just a buildup. I'm showing how God used the situation that was going to prepare the Jews for something that was going to take place for six days in 1967. Mm -hmm. Finally, they call in the Air Force, and the Air Force didn't miss. And uh, they got the job done. 
But during that time, it was some of the biggest dogfight Air Forces and battles ever since uh, the Second World War. I think that even then they didn't have such, well, jet planes for sure. It was the biggest uh, air fights that they had over here. And it was the MiG-17 against, uh, I think, the Hunters and the Mirage. There was a French plane and the British Hunter plane and the Tornado planes that they had back then. And I think in one day they dropped like 80 aircraft over these skies that we have. And all of that, um, the years I'm talking about is the 60s, the late 65, 66. And it was going to be a buildup towards uh, 1967. When Nazil says, okay, enough of this nonsense. Now that we're united, we're going to have to gather everybody from all around, all the armies around. And we're going to choke this state of Israel. And we're going to finish what we didn't finish in 1948. So they start gathering these armies. They start mobilizing humongous forces of armies. And they start making their way to the borders of Israel. And brothers and sisters, I am telling you, uh, every time there's a situation that looks very bad, what's going to happen? I always think about those days. I wasn't alive back then, but I heard people who were and how fearful they were. Because you didn't have to have a lot. You didn't have to be a big, huge general with a strategic view to understand what was going on. All you had to know is you're outnumbered 20 to 1. You don't stand a chance. There's no way that our physical, logical, common sense, there's no way that we could have made it out of that war. Just a simple, even she can do that kind of math. <laughs> they did not have a chance to survive. Anybody who had a foreign passport was out of here. They were getting out as fast as they could. The joke was, last one to leave the airport, don't forget to turn off the lights. Everything seemed to be going against us at that time. And the Prime Minister was Levi Eskol, a peaceful dove. We needed a hawk of war. And uh, it seemed like, oh no, we're all going to die. And these armies are coming closer and closer and closer. And uh, every time Israel went to different diplomatic, trying to get out of it in a diplomatic situation, well, we'll try to negotiate, but it doesn't look like it was going to happen. It was good knowing you, Israel. I guess it wasn't meant to happen. You had a nice 17 years, but I guess mm, this is all it. Done, yeah. And all the diplomats started pulling out of here. Embassies started closing down. All their families were leaving because it was obvious what's going to be here. It's going to be a horrible, horrible bloodbath. Mm. They started digging hot, uh, ditches. Throughout all the highways and the baseball stadiums, the actually soccer stadiums, they were digging it, preparing mass graves, because it was obviously, it's going to be a disaster. It's going to be the destruction of the third temple, they said. As if this was the third temple of the state of Israel. Mm -hmm. uh, the chief of staff at that time, is a man by the name of Itzhak Rabin. Remember, he was a general in his 20s. Now he's the chief of staff. He goes to his mentor to receive advice. He goes to his mentor to receive advice. His mentor is David Ben-Gurion, the first prime minister. David Ben-Gurion chews him upside down. You and your generals brought this disaster on us. What were you thinking? Why couldn't you just let the leadership find a diplomatic way? The politics, let them find a diplom. The guy is so discouraged, he has a nervous breakdown. So the war is about to begin, and the chief of staff is in a psychiatric uh, hospital. Well, he was at home. They told the people it was a nicotine attack. Just because you don't want the people to know that the chief of staff is even out now. And there's, at the whole time, there's different people trying to prevent this as much as they can. Eventually, um, Jamal Abdel Nasser, he brings his forces into the Sinai Peninsula. And that was, uh, he was not allowed to do that according to 
the peace that the to the bring safat I give us the message. According to the peace, uh, not the peace, but the ceasefire agreements that they had, it was all full of UN peacekeepers. And he tells the UN peacekeepers, get out of here. There's going to be no peace for you to keep. And they fought it out. He says, okay, we're going to do a united government. We're going to be in the coalition, the opposition into the coalition. He turns this one eyed general, the next one eyed general, into the minister of defense, a man by the name of uh, Moshe Dayan, <laughs> trying to bring up the morale of the people. And it's not seeming to work. And eventually, uh, Jamal Abdel Nazir, he goes on one of the first uh, satellite broadcasts of the Egyptian uh, television, and he has a live broadcast. And in, ha in the back of him, he has the map of the Middle East with Israel. And he's telling everybody what we're going to do. We have no choice. we got to get rid of these people, you know. We have to. And then he turns to the Israelis and says, Now listen to me and listen good. I did not kill your ancestors in Europe. I didn't put them in the gas chamber. I had nothing to do with that. And I don't know why they decided that because of this you need to come here. But no, that was a mistake. You don't belong here. You're not Arab. You don't have this culture of the people. You don't know the land. You just, it will be good if you just get up and leave. Because I'm coming with my army. We're going to come from here. 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 And when I come... As far as I consider, there's only one place for Jews in the Middle East. And he points into the Mediterranean Sea. And that was his mistake, brother. He was indeed a great social leader and cared about his people. But uh, obviously, to make such a statement, he was missing a certain book, Larry, in his library. And if he would have read that book, Larry, he would have learned that Jews don't swim. Really? They Jews walk. don't swim. They walk. Yeah, I know there was this, uh, one of our ancestors, many, many years ago, thousands of years ago, there was a big flood coming upon the whole earth. He didn't start taking swimming lessons. No, he built a big ark, brought a whole bunch of animals in because Jews don't swim. Later on, uh, there was this guy, Moses, he went and delivered his people from the Egyptians. He brought them to the Reed Sea. They didn't swim across the Red Sea. No, Jews don't swim. He picks up his staff and the water departs and they walk. On dry land. On dry land. His successor, a guy by the name of Joshua, has lead them into the promised land through the Jordan River. You think they swam through the Jordan, sister? No, they bring the Ark of the Covenant, the priest starts the water. That is it. They walk through because Jews don't swim. On there was, dry uh, land. On dry land. There was a prophet by the name of uh, Elijah. He was going to go be taken up to heaven. He had to cross the Jordan. He didn't swim across the Jordan. No, he walked. His successor, Elisha, did the same thing. The water stopped and they, he walked as well. And uh, even there was this great prophet. He got thrown overboard. He doesn't start swimming, but a big fish eats him because Jews don't swim. <laughs> and even that lake... Uh, 2,000 years ago, there was a great rabbi, he came, he, he didn't swim on the water, he walked on the water, because <laughs> Jews don't swim. But they do fly planes, come to find out, Larry, and not too bad at all. Since the <laughs> chief of staff was having a nervous breakdown, it put this other guy by the name of Ezra Weitzman, who was his second in command, it got him as the commander-in-chief and he was an Air Force guy but he was crazy I think God held that man all the way up for 1967 <laughs> for 1967 because everything he did before I don't think was so important and everything he did after even though he became the president of Israel but I think he was the man that God chose for that moment in that time and he was considered to be crazy really because he had this fantasy plan how he's going to destroy all the air forces around Israel in one day. <laughs> and everybody laughed at him. you got to be crazy. Not only that, even if you wanted to do this, you can't do it because you don't have enough planes. Oh, that's right, he said. Well, I have to use the same planes over and over again. 
And this guy starts planning. He puts all of his efforts, all of his finance, all the finance of the Israeli Air Force, he puts in for this one mission and training his pilots and buying the planes that will be capable of doing this mission. And uh, the mission is to destroy all the enemy air forces in one day. To do so, he would start training his pilots where they could uh, drop these bombs without missing. He develops a bomb that seems to be useless. I mean, all it does is a big bang and a big hole. But come to find out, it takes out the landing strips. Planes can't take off after they have these bombs dropped on them. And they're very easy to hit the target as well. And then he trains his um, pilots to be very, very efficient and navigate. We're talking about before GPS, there was a thing that you would roll up a piece of paper called a Thomas map. Card. And there was a <laughs> thing called a, it would always show you the north and the coordinates and the waypoints and stuff like that. This is before GPS. They had to be able to navigate to their target, to identify it, and to destroy it from way above. He turns the ground troops of the Air Force, he turns it into a race. Who can rearm, refuel these planes as fast as possible, and the team that does it fastest so the plane can take off is going to get a case of champagne. And he starts training them quickly 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 and he has these races going on every other week to get them into shape so they can go and refuel and rearm the planes so they can take off every time he hears about a spy anywhere he would beg the intelligence community to send them out to go get some more information about the planes how they're parked how many they are what kind of planes if he can take pictures of them one of these spies that would help him the most would be a man by the name of Eli Cohen. And he operated here in Syria. He was probably the greatest spy in the world, actually. He got so high into the leadership of uh, Syria that many of the Ba'ath party actually considered him to be a personal friend, not knowing that he was a Jew born in Alexandria, who built his cover as a Syrian merchant in Argentina, and he would befriend people so good that they decided, we need people like you back home in Syria. You need to go back to Syria. We'll even give you the letters of recommendation. And they would, he would go back and he would get an apartment in Damascus. And sure enough, he would become friends of the highest leadership. He was eventually caught uh, because they uh, he just had so much information that he would broadcast, it was just uh, unbelievable. I don't think there was a spy ever that broadcast so much. And uh, it was actually what got him caught eventually, not knowing that the radio silence was uh, declared for three days, and this new Soviet equipment was able to pick up the broadcasting of uh, Eli Cohen. And finally, he was a spy who was executed, and his body was never returned to Israel. But anyhow, the Israelis by 67 knew everything about the pilots by their names, uh, where their houses are, how far their houses are from their planes, uh, when they sleep with their wives, when they sleep with their mistress, what they have for breakfast, how long it takes them to get from point A to the uh, aircraft. They knew it all and we had no idea, would say the Egyptians afterwards. Eventually, Nazir keeps coming closer and closer and closer. And it doesn't look like the negotiations are able to help. And at a certain point, he decides to close off the Straits of Tehran. And at that point, no ships can come to Israel. Nothing from China. And uh, that was also pretty much Kazus Bailey. And about then, they s decided to give Ezra Weizmann the green light because he kept nagging him. If you let me start this war, if you give me the initiative, I promise you, I can give you this war. And finally, on the fifth day of June of 1967, Israel took a great chance by leaving only two planes patrol the skies every other plane any plane that was capable of carrying ammunition even the training planes were armed that day and to a 
total, total radio silence. If only you knew today in 2023, 2022, how many communications were done with your plane and the tower before it took off. That was totally silence. And they had to have all the planes up at the same time above their targets. And the only way they can do that if one plane took off one after the other with one minute apart from one plane to the other. And it was all done with flags and flashlights. And they were all took they all took off and they head west and they turned around and came into Egypt from the west where they were not expecting. And at seven fifteen, just like they planned, when they were all above their targets all at once started taking down, destroying airfields and planes while they're still on the ground. They did not even get a chance to take off. And even if they did, the second wave would come behind and destroy them in no time. All of this was done during the, while they were still being fired at with the, everything that the Egyptians had, but still they were able by the early hours of the morning to destroy most of West uh, Egypt's airfields and air forces and planes while they were still on the ground. And then they came back, refueled, rearmed, and went into the Sinai Peninsula and destroyed all the air forces' planes that was over there. By the late morning, they refueled, rearmed, and they went into Jordan. And by noontime, they already came back, refueled, rearmed, went into Syria. And by the eve of that day, they went and had desert in Iraq and Israel had air supremacy in the Middle East. And from that day on, it was just an issue of sending in the ground troops under the cover of the Israeli Air Force to mop up these humongous armies that came against us. By the third day, the Egyptian army was no more. By the fourth and fifth day, the Jordanian army was no more. And they were already ready and willing to finish the war, but all these villages that were gonna pass down here they sent delegations to the government that no, you cannot finish this war without taking the Golan Heights. Because for 19 years, the Syrians sat right above our heads, firing down into the different villages in the Hula Valley and in the Galilee. So indeed, they say that Moshe Dayan took this call himself, mobilized the Golani Brigade and the Peru Troopers, and in one day, they took all of the Golan Heights, where we're about to go next. And the map and all the geopolitics of Israel would forever change from that day, the Six Day War in 1967. Yes, sir. How come after six jihads, 200 million Muslims can't wipe out 15 million Jews? How come? I call it the God factor. Exactly. Just like the story of Gideon yesterday with a few men. What he says is absolutely true. I mean, these battles are very hard to study in different academies around the world because it just doesn't make sense. And they'll, they'll you if you keep studying it eventually, you'll find something that your brain can deal with and say, okay, I guess that was the reason. Stuff like... Well, when they came in these trenches, the Israeli had the submachine gun Uzi, and they had the AK, so they were fat. But it's all excuses trying to explain God, 60, as if God is not in control of the 67, Uzi. In 67, Israel wasn't even 20 years old. You had five standing armies from five different countries, prepared, trained armies, and the fighters in Israel were really... That's why Israel has so many reservists now, is because they were just the Israeli people. For the most, yeah, some could fly planes, some could run a tank, and that kind of stuff. But as far as the standing army, they weren't. It just demonstrates the God of Israel and his love for his people that he brought back in the land. That story you were telling earlier today. Exactly right. So brothers and sisters, after that time, Israel tripled its size. It got the Golan Heights, it got all the Sinai Peninsula, all the West Bank, Jerusalem was united in six days. 
and everybody was marveling. They thought this country was going to be destroyed, but the opposite happened. So my girl is uh, reminding me that we need to go. Yala yala. Yala yala. We, we have. I want to show you some more stuff over here. If you don't mind.